Well, good morning, everybody, and it's lovely to see you all there this cold, uh, but nevertheless very friendly Saturday morning. And we're going to come together this morning to learn about the hope for the world. So what we'll do is, if you stay seated, uh, we'll just seek God's blessing on our meeting together in prayer. Our gracious and ever-loving, merciful Lord God, we come before you now to give you thanks for all your goodness and your mercy, that we can come together and open your word, the Bible, so that we can understand your plan and purpose with mankind, with all of us as individuals. God can learn about the hope that is throughout your pages of Scripture. Lord Jesus, that we have the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for us, so that even though we have sin entering in the world at the very beginning, we have the fall of mankind, there was always that hope through the words of the Lord Jesus, the promises made to Abraham. In you, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Remember the promises made to David, and that he would have a son that would sit on his throne in Jerusalem, that would reign forever. So his prayer was that even though he fell asleep, he died, his, he sleeps in the dust of the earth. Nevertheless, his flesh rests in hope because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we continue to seek for truth in your Bible, and moreover, that, Lord God, we consider our actions and our response we too can become your sons and your daughters through the waters of baptism. We can become part of that saved people to reign with the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem. So we pray that everything we do and say here this morning will rise acceptably before you and we pray earnestly for your kingdom to come where there shall truly be peace on earth. We ask this prayer then through the saving name of the Lord Jesus. So we're delighted to have Richard Snelling with us this morning uh, to speak to us on There is Hope for the World. So we're going to take uh, a Bible reading to get us underway. Um, the Bible that I've got is the New King James Version from the back. So if you have that version, it's Psalm 16 and it's on page 787. So that's Psalm 16 and it's on page 787. There's a title of the psalm, and it says, A Mitchum of David, and that means an engraving psalm. So that's a, a principle that we try to engrave uh, this psalm into our hearts and our minds, that we try not to forget what it's saying. So Psalm 16, page 787, Psalm of David. Preserve me, O oh God, for in you I put my trust. O oh my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names on my lips. O oh Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol or the grave, 
nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So with that brief introduction, uh, we're delighted to ask Richard to come forward and speak to us on the subject, There is Hope for the World. Richard. Well, good morning everybody. Good to be here to see you all and to uh, welcome you all this morning. And this morning we're going to look at the subject, Hope for a Hopeless World, and what a state the world is in. There are wars and there's famines and there's pestilences we find there's problems because asylum seekers are seeking to get away from where they live because of oppression and they many of them end up dead drowned in the mediterranean we have mass shootings we have drug problems the state of the world is not a happy state and there is so much suffering and misery that goes along with it. And man seems to limp along from crisis to crisis without solving any of these problems. There is a lack of peace and tranquility and happiness in this world. So what's going to happen? Is it going to get worse and worse? What will it be like for our children? So. What does man offer for hope? Nothing really. What hope can we have in our lives? Um, we might start off thinking, oh, I'm going to get a good education, get a good job, I'll get married, and I'll have some children, and will I have good health? You might hope for good health, but in the end, all our hopes just pass away. But it's very easy for us to have false hopes, hopes which are not enduring, hopes which are not lasting. And we know that the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's important for us to fully understand the gospel which the Lord Jesus um, taught. Because there we have him offering us a wonderful, lasting hope. So it's very easy for us to have false hopes, but the Bible has the answer to an eternal hope. Very easy to think that perhaps a new government or a new regime will make things better, and they rise up in revolution thinking everything is going to be great, but it's not. They think that they will improve their lives, but it doesn't happen. But that's what the state of our world is in. Now we know from Proverbs, there is a way that which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So, yes, perhaps this world might offer us a hope here or hope there, but it's not lasting and it's not enduring. Well, let's think about this, the immortal soul. Should we hope and trust in the belief of an immortal soul? Now that idea, these ideas are the backbone of the Christianity, the Christian belief. But is it true? Do we have a soul and does it go to heaven when we die? The phrase immortal soul is not found in the word of God. But let's look at what the adherents of this belief say. Here then we have um, Dr. Bennett from former Dean of Chester and he said it was Augustine who took Plato's doctrine, Plato we remember as a Greek philosopher, of the inherent immortality of the soul, disengaged it from the ideas of reincarnation and gained for it the general uh, credence which is held to this day. No doctrine of the natural or unconditional immortality of a part or nucleus of the human organism called soul 
has any right of place within the precinct of revealed Christian truth. It's not to be found in the Bible. And Bishop Gore said, the doctrine of the necessary immortality or indestructibility of each human soul, as stated, for instance, by Augustine or Aquinas, was no part of the original Christian message. It was rather a speculation of Platonism, taking possession of the church. So basically, Paul didn't preach it, Peter didn't preach it, and the Lord Jesus most certainly not didn't preach the immortality of the soul. It didn't form part of the gospel. Again, in 1945, towards the conversion of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury and York said, the idea of the inherent indestructibility of the human soul owes its origin to Greek, not to Bible sources. And we could keep on quoting. So basically, it's a right fudge. Bits and pieces, ideas of men, ideas from the Greek philosophers came in and they taught the immortality of the soul. But what's incredible is that so many Christians out there believe that there is something immortal about us that lives on forever. And we have a contrast to church teaching, church history, and the Bible. We find that the Bible claims to be the word of God. And it can be substantiated, particularly through um, prophecies that come to pass, very, very, um, dif well, not difficult, very fine prophecies, information that is given aforetime that will come to pass. Now, the Word of God shows us exactly what to believe and hope in. What is the true hope? And the whole purpose and plan of God with this earth is found in the Bible. It's the inspired word of God. It was God-breathed. Yes, men wrote it down as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But as soon as they'd written it down, they'd often have to try and work out what it all meant. It was inspired. And it shows itself to be inspired. Now, coming to the um, psalm that we had read a few minutes ago, we have there the hope of David. David was a man after God's own heart. He had a love for God. He had a desire to try to serve him and to please him. He tried to follow God's commandments. Oh, he failed like everyone does fail. But you have him here rejoicing in that wonderful hope in red. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Although he might be in the grave, he would have hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And here he is speaking of the Lord Jesus, God's holy one. God would not leave to be corrupted. So the third day he was raised before corruption came. So he believed, David, in the resurrection of the dead. And he realized that central to the hope that we have in the Bible is the Lord Jesus. Now, in Acts 2, we find that Peter talks about, um, talks about uh, David and this psalm and he says this, this is on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter. He said, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us this day. And he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption 
And it then goes on to tell us in that verse 34, for David, a man after God's own heart, is not ascended into the heavens. There is nothing immortal about us that goes to heaven when we die. Again, we have this hope of resurrection with um, Job. And Job said, now he was the one that God brought uh, many trials upon. And he said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he said, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Whom I shall see for myself, for mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. So there was a hope of resurrection for Job. And there was also a hope of resurrection for, Ma for Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Now in John 11... Jesus uh, hears from messengers sent by Mary and Martha, oh, your friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus, who is in a distant town, deliberately doesn't come immediately to help. They knew that the Lord Jesus could heal people, but he deliberately waited until Lazarus was dead. And then he goes to Bethany and he sees the two sisters. Verse 21, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. I don't know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. And Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So, Lazarus, in this chapter 11, was raised up by the Lord Jesus, and he would have remained upon the earth for a certain number of years, and he would die. But they believed in the resurrection of the dead, where those who are judged worthy shall live forever in God's kingdom. Now, we had the hope of the resurrection, but what else did these faithful of the Old Testament and the New Testament hope for? Well, they hoped for the coming kingdom of God. And in Psalm 72, we see here a passage relating to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, who is to be the righteous king. A Psalm of Solomon. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. Now this king, this ruler, is going to be different from all the rulers we've had before. And we know how power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But here is one who will do justice and judgment and righteousness. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Verse 4, he will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the needy. Uh, the children of the needy, and break in pieces the oppressor. And the wonderful blessings that come upon the earth is just like the rain, verse 6, coming upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. And in his days, the righteous shall flourish. You're not going to have all the, the problems that we see now in the world. We're going to have righteousness and peace. And there will be desire of the people to go up to the temple of the Lord, that they might worship God in truth. And the Lord's Jesus' kingdom is going to start in Israel, 
until it eventually encompasses the whole world. He shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. And besides helping the poor and the needy, we find in verse 16, there's going to be no more famines. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the top of the mountains, even on the mountain tops, there'll be growing crops and food to feed the populations. It fruit shall wave like Lebanon. And so, verse 17, his name shall endure forever and continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. So there's going to be a wonderful blessing on the earth. And those who are the worthies, who've been judged worthy by the Lord Jesus, they will inherit the kingdom and help the Lord Jesus reign in that kingdom to come. There's going to be a quality of life. Who wants to live forever? in the state that the world is in here, with all that violence and wickedness and evil. There's going to be a quality of life to those who receive um, immortality and incorruptibility. So the faithful throughout the ages have always believed in God's coming kingdom. And it formed the backbone of the gospel that the Lord Jesus preached. And it really is, essence, the hope of the promises which are made uh, in the Old Testament in particular. We find that were important promises to Adam, to Abraham, and to David. And they hoped for those promises to come to pass. These promises, which many Christians are ignorant of, form the backbone of the preaching of the gospel. They formed the, what the Lord Jesus spoke about when he went through all Galilee and Judea in Jerusalem. He preached about these wonderful promises. But we haven't got time to look at all the promises, so um, I don't know if you can help me out here, uh, Brother Andrew. Uh, I haven't got a new uh, uh, King James Version, so perhaps you can shout out what pages we're going to go to. So looking at Genesis chapter 12, we find the, the blessings of the seed and for all nations. Or perhaps if you'd like to, I could uh, read it out from that Bible. Brother Andrew. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we're told in Genesis 12 then, now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I want to get a hold of that last phrase in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed and the wonderful blessing is the forgiveness of our sins even through the lord jesus going into chapter 13 of genesis over the page we find there he was also promised the blessing of the land verse 14 and the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. So Abraham was given these important blessings, but did he receive them? Well, if we look in um, Acts chapter 7, verse 
Acts 7, that's uh, 1571. We have here Stephen's defense before the Sanhedrin. They didn't like him preaching the good news of the gospel, talking about the Lord Jesus as the coming king. They didn't like um, what these people, these Christians were saying. And Stephen's defense in verse 3, he's speaking about Abraham. And God said to Abraham, get you out of your country from your relatives and come to a land I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it. Not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abram had no child, when he was 99, he had no child. He promised, God promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. So, will God keep his word? Will he give that land to Abram and his seed? Well, Abram was a remarkable figure of faith, man of faith. And it says there in Romans, who against hope? Now he was nearly a hundred years old. And Sarah, his wife, was barren. She was childless. And she was 90. And she'd gone past the manner of women when you can expect a baby. But against hope, he believed in hope. He believed God that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall I seed be. Now, if you turn to uh, Hebrews 11, we've got some remarkable figures of faith. 1725. Remarkable figures of faith. Full of the faithful down through the ages. Um, if you look in verse 4, it mentions Abel. He offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. In verse 5, we got Enoch. Then we have um, Noah in verse 7. But it's Abram I want to pick up on and to read verse 8 to 16. By faith, Abram obeyed. When he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. And by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And by faith, Sarah herself also received strength. And she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the sea shore. Now, let's get a hold of verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off in faith, were assured of them, and they embraced them. They grabbed hold of them and held tight to them. They weren't going to let them go. That was their hope. And they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had been called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Hang on a second. I thought Abram was promised an earthly country. Look northward, southward, eastward and westward. But why is it called heavenly? 
Well, it's remarkable in actual fact when we come to the first um, gospel in the New Testament that over 30 times we have there the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. But it doesn't say the kingdom in heaven, but it's a kingdom based on heavenly principles, God's principles, and not the ideas of men. So these people had the eye of faith. They believed God. They staggered not at those promises. Now we know from reading the scripture that salvation is conditional. This is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's so important to understand what Jesus actually preached in his gospel. We have to know and believe the full gospel. And then the process, we must believe and be baptized. And then try to follow the Lord Jesus if we want to obtain that wonderful inheritance of immortality and incorruptibility. Now Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 that there are different ways, different opportunities for men. And he says there, enter ye by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. Interesting in the same chapter that there are those who are delusional. They don't understand the full gospel. They don't try to follow the Lord Jesus properly. And there are those when the time of judgment comes who will say, uh, Lord, Lord, um, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And in the same chapter, the Lord Jesus describes the man who builds his house upon the sand and the man who is wise enough to build his house on the rock. So what the Bible offers us, if we are willing to read it carefully and apply it in our life, is an enduring hope. A hope of eternal life without the problems that beset us now. I want to close now with a beautiful passage which tells us Another one of those kingdom pictures. For well, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be a curse. So we notice that Although there are people who are with the Lord Jesus, helping him um, reign in his kingdom, there are also a mortal population who will die, but they won't be die dying in a young age. Even someone who is a sinner, um, he will be called, oh, he's, he's died as, as a child. He's a hundred years old. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. 
For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt, nor destroy, in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. and peace shall fill the earth, sorrow, sighing, and even ultimately death shall be no more. What a wonderful hope we have. So we'd like to invite you to further talks uh, next Sunday at 6 o'clock here in this hall. On the 10th of December we have another talk which is God's plan for the world. And that's uh, by Stephen Mock and he'll pick up on some of the themes uh, that we've discussed uh, and explored together this morning. The next Saturday special will be next year, 2024. It seems a bit weird to say that, doesn't it? That 2023 is coming to a close already. Uh, but God willing, uh, on the 6th of January, uh, same time at 10.30, the subject is New Year's Resolution, Understanding the Bible's Message of Salvation. So that's a lovely thing to think about, isn't it? Our new resolution, a new beginning, how are we going to discover God's truth together. Just a, one little comment. We had uh, somebody walk past last time for our Saturday special and they uh, asked if they could have a Bible uh, because they couldn't come in. Uh, but anyway, the same person came back today and said, can we have some more Bibles because I'd like to give them to my two daughters. So isn't it wonderful that God's plan and message and hope of salvation through the Bible is still working out uh, to bring one here uh, and one there too. So let's uh, close eyes and close our meeting together then for a short prayer. God, we come before you once again to praise your name and to give you thanks for this quiet time that we've been able to open your word, the Bible, together. That we've learned, Lord God, about the hope of salvation for all mankind. That the promise of everlasting life in your kingdom has been available all the way from the very beginning. The promises made to Abraham, to David, and even to us in these last days. That through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, sin can be washed away. And we can come forth as your sons and your daughters. As the Lord Jesus Christ said, he is the resurrection and the life. He that believes in him. Though he were dead, yet surely shall live. And so that marvellous hope of resurrection from the grave in the last day, that death is but a sleep until the Lord Jesus Christ shall return with the trump and with the sound of the archangel. And those who sleep, those who are dead in Christ, shall rise first. So, Lord God, we would pray that you will be with us as we can continue to seek your truth, that we continue to read from your Bible and try to understand its, its message and hope for each and every one of us, but moreover that that hope becomes a burning desire in our hearts and our minds to follow after you, to truly understand what we need to do in our lives to become heirs of the promises made to our forefathers. Oh Lord God, we would pray that you will be with us throughout this coming week. Guard, guide, and keep us safe. And our earnest prayer is for your kingdom to come, where Jerusalem shall be again a praise in the earth, a 
truly city of peace, where righteousness and peace shall be forevermore, and sorrow and sighing, and even death itself shall pass away. It's not there that we pray, dear Father, that we are people in the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the thing we look looking for.